Hello, and welcome to Past, the podcast about those who would never rule. I'm Veronica Fortune, and this week's episode is Lady Margaret Beaufort, Part 2. Welcome back. You may be able to tell I have a bit of a cold. It's been going around my entire family the last few weeks. I am recovering, and hopefully I'll make it through this episode well. My daughter, Little Miss, is on school holidays, and she's in the room with me right now. So if you hear occasional humming or some coloring, it's just what I have to do to get through this. (laughs) Thank you for your understanding. (laughs) Now on to the episode. Last week when we left Margaret, her husband had just died and she was pregnant. While we don't know how Margaret felt about the death of her husband, fear would probably have been the forefront, as opposed to grief. There was one person who was devastated with Edmund Tudor's passing, his brother Jasper. I'm sure Henry VI was upset as well, at least if he was in the state of mind to understand. But Jasper was heartbroken. Jasper, though, had an important task. He needed to get to his young sister-in-law. He reached her quickly and transported her to his stronghold, Pembroke Castle, which was thankfully only two miles away from her late husband's property. Other than Jasper, his servants and her servants, who had accompanied them, she would have been alone there. This would have been a terrifying condition to give birth in. Her mother and older sisters wouldn't be there to comfort her or help her through the rough parts. It does appear a midwife was at least called for, which is lucky and probably the only reason Margaret survived this ordeal. On the 28th of January, she gave birth to her only child, Henry of Richmond known to us as Henry Tudor, or Henry VII, once he became king. As I mentioned in an earlier episode, almost no one took note. This young Henry, likely named for his royal uncle, was just the son of a deceased nobleman and his distantly royal widow. While he was theoretically close to the throne, he had been born into the middle of a civil war that was anything but civil. Margaret may have only been a child herself, but she was fierce in her protection of her son. Due to noble birth and the political situation, Henry Tudor would not spend much of his early life with his mother, but the two formed a strong bond that would last to the end of both their lives. There is a tale, written down well after his birth, that Henry was originally named Owen after his grandfather, but that Margaret insisted he be called Henry at his baptism. While I don't know if this is true, and Nicola Tallis couldn't find any further sources, it's not out of the question that Margaret would get what she wanted due to her strong will, as we'll see throughout the next few episodes. While Margaret had just gone through what was likely the most physically traumatic event of her life, and survived, she was still at risk. She was a wealthy widow, and as Rex Factor fans know, this can make a woman a deed title. Any man who could possess her could, in theory, marry her, and then hold her property. Yes, she was under the protection of her brother-in-law, who, despite suggestions in historical fiction, appears to have never been a love interest of hers. But he couldn't always be there. He was a soldier, after all, and under command of the king. To the king, while also her brother-in-law, she was a pawn who could be used to make alliances. Plus, Henry didn't really have control even when he did. Remember, civil war. Instead of waiting for someone to kidnap her, Margaret took matters into her own hands. With the help of Jasper, she picked her next husband. Yes, this was a rare occurrence in this time period. A noble woman who was as young as Margaret often had her marriages arranged. But her brother-in-law being her protector awarded her some control. Jasper did, of course, handle the initial pleasantries. He made contact with his fellow Lancastrian, Humphrey, Duke of Buckingham. Humphrey was the son of Anne of Gloucester, the only surviving child of Thomas of Woodstock, the youngest son of Edward III. Remember, there was a huge age gap between Thomas and his next closest brother, Edmund. This made him distantly royal, but a loyal Lancastrian. Now, remember how I mentioned that Lady Margaret Beaufort has a cousin who shares the same name? Well, she's about to come up. Humphrey's oldest son, whom was also a Humphrey, was already married to the cousin of Lady Margaret Beaufort, who shared her name. But his second son, Henry Stafford, was unmarried, 
I'll refer to Henry Stafford as Stafford, his father as Humphrey, and his brother as Earl Stafford, since his courtesy title was the Earl of Stafford. This also means that Humphrey will have two daughter-in-laws named Margaret Beaufort. In addition to being descended through Edward III via his youngest son, Humphrey's sons were also descended through John of Gaunt via his daughter Joan Beaufort. Her daughter, Anne Neville, was Humphrey's wife and Henry's mother. Yes, everyone is related, and in this case, they all have the same names. Margaret left Wales as soon as she was churched, that 40-day wait after birth that women took in this era. She arrived at Humphrey's property with Jasper, and negotiations began in earnest. Henry Stafford was approximately 31 and apparently suffered from ill health, which points to why he wasn't married yet. But he had two things Margaret needed, a powerful family and loyalty to Lancaster and Henry VI. Nicola Tallis also theorizes that Margaret may have decided not to have any further children, understandable with the trauma of her first birth, and marrying an older, by the standards of the day, man who was a second son could be ideal. He may have also suffered from leprosy, which could preclude having children or even marital relations. Dispensation for the marriage was approved on the 6th of April, 1457. Remember, they were related in the fourth and third degree on both sides. The couple would wait until Margaret's year-long mourning period was complete before marrying in early January 1458. Margaret was 14. While there was a large age gap between the couple, and it was a business arrangement more than a love match, it appears that Stafford was able to make his wife happy, and that the couple cared for each other greatly. With her marriage, though, Margaret lost something she cared for more than anything else. Her son. His wardship was given to his uncle, Jasper Tudor, though this may have been agreed to prior to her wedding. He would be safer at Jasper's seat of Pembroke than in England, so it was a wise choice. Henry Tudor would spend much of his life before he became king in his uncle's care. Less than three years after her third wedding, Margaret's world was completely changed. In July of 1460, her father-in-law Humphrey was killed at the Battle of Northampton. His oldest son had predeceased him, so Stafford's nephew succeeded to the dukedom. As you should all remember, in late October 1460, the Act of Accord was reached. With this, Richard of York was declared Henry VI's heir, disinheriting Edward of Westminster, Prince of Wales, and putting York's line next in the line of succession. York was also appointed Protector of England, yet again. In addition to destroying the royal state in England, it also moved Margaret and her son significantly down in the line of succession. They were now behind Richard of York and his four sons and three daughters. Queen Margaret was enraged by this, as one could expect. Of course, York's hold on power didn't last long. He and his second son, Edmund of Rutland, would be killed on the 30th of December, 1460, with York's brother-in-law, Salisbury, being executed not much later. It would have appeared that the Yorkist cause was lost, but York's heir and oldest son, Edward of March, now Duke of York, didn't give up the fight. On the 2nd of January, he faced off against Lancastrian forces at the Battle of Mortimer's Cross. The Lancastrian forces included Owen and Jasper Tudor. Yorkist forces won, and in a move that shocked most alive at the time, and the victim most of all, Owen Tudor was executed after his capture. Remember, ransom was the usual way these things were done. But Edward of March, or Edward of York, was not going to take prisoners. Owen Tudor was actually recorded saying, quote, That head shall lie on the stock that was wont to lie on Queen Catherine's lap. End quote just prior to his death. Jasper was able to escape, which is great for the rest of the story. However, with his father dead and him on the run, Margaret's son, Henry, was left without a guardian. Oh, and he was in Wales. Of course, 15 days later, the Lancastrian forces defeated the Yorkists at the Second Battle of St. Albans. Even with this win, their cause was lost. Edward of York would be acclaimed king in early April. Margaret could not have been pleased with this result, 
but she would be pleased that Henry VI, Queen Margaret, and their son were still at large. At the Battle of Towton, at the end of March, Edward, now Edward IV, soundly defeated the Lancastrian forces. King Henry, Queen Margaret, their son, and their supporters would flee to Scotland and Wales. Margaret's husband, Stafford, had fought on the Lancastrian side during the battle, and this meant he and Margaret were in danger. Margaret's life was likely never at risk. Women were rarely killed, unless you had visions. But her property could be forfeit, and her husband could be executed. Margaret was lucky, though. Granted, this was her husband's doing. You'll remember that his mother was Anne Neville. She happened to be the oldest sister of Cecily Neville, Edward IV's mother. Stafford was Edward IV's first cousin. He was pardoned on the 25th of June, 1461. This also protected Margaret's property. With this pardon, though, there was a price. Stafford and his younger brother switched sides to York. Just to be really clear, at this point, Margaret was only 18. But it all wasn't less than bad news. There was some actual horrible news coming Margaret's way. Her brother-in-law, Jasper Tudor, was declared a rebel on the 10th of August, and Edward IV sent men to take possession of Jasper's property, including Pembroke, where Margaret's son was living. At the same time, the property of Stafford's nephew, Henry, the young second Duke of Buckingham, who was six, was taken control of by the king's men. The safety that Margaret had so carefully negotiated for was basically gone. Margaret's late stepfather, Lord Wells, was attained along with at least 150 loyal Lancastrians at Edward's first parliament in November. Remember, an attainder is there to basically stop the next generation from receiving the property they would have from the attained individual. In this case, it would impact Margaret's oldest stepbrother and may have impacted her younger half-brother. Margaret and her mother were lucky, though. Parliament protected their lands, at least for the time being. Her son, though, became a ward of the king once Pembroke was secured. It appears Henry was able to stay at Pembroke until his guardian was named. In February 1416, his wardship was granted to Sir William Herbert. Herbert paid more than £600,000 in today's money for this. With his wardship assigned, Henry moved to Herbert's stronghold, Raglan Castle. Herbert had actually been York's commander and had taken Carmarthen from Margaret's second husband, Edmund. Yes, her son had just been granted to the man who was somewhat responsible for his father's death. Luckily for Margaret and Henry, Herbert and his wife were kind and judicious guardians, and Henry was rather fond of both of them, but especially Herbert's wife. Herbert would eventually be named Earl of Pembroke. The title was considered forfeit by Jasper Tudor. This would make him a powerful Welsh landholder and magnate. Both Margaret and Stafford were able to write to Henry regularly, and it appears that Stafford took an interest in his stepson's upbringing. Margaret, of course, was very concerned that her son be raised well. She, being a lover of learning, didn't have much to worry about in that area. Young Henry was well-educated, and the Herberts really treated him as though he were their own child. Henry was apparently an excellent student, though this may be flattery, but he showed himself to be a well-learned king. But in September of 1462, he was stripped of his title, which was transferred to the king's brother, George, Duke of Clarence. This gives us a great moment to talk about Henry's name. While today we call him Henry VII, or Henry Tudor, this isn't what he would have been called during his lifetime. Until he was stripped of his earldom, he would have been Henry of Richmond, or Lord Richmond, which Margaret would call him until he became king. And an interesting note, his guardian, Herbert, also called him Lord Richmond. The same way we call the competing houses in the Wars of the Roses, Lancaster and York, their titles, when they're both legally Plantagenet, hyphen Lancaster or York. I will stick to calling young Lord Richmond Henry Tudor because that's how most know him today, and I don't want to confuse things. While Margaret's future seemed secure for the moment, a family member was about to put it at risk. Her cousin, Henry Beaufort, the son of Edmund Beaufort, defected from the Lancastrian cause and begged Edward IV's forgiveness. 
he and his widow mother were pardoned and he was brought into the fold in March of 1463 and restored to his titles by the end of April. But this defection was not complete. Less than a year later, he switched sides again. After making his escape from a stronghold, he rose against Edward's forces and was defeated by Warwick's brother Montague at the Battle of Hexham in May 1464. He was captured and beheaded following the loss. This could have been terrible news for the Lancastrians who had remained in England and submitted to Edward. Beaufort's mother was imprisoned in rather deplorable conditions, but those who hadn't was against the king were safe. He didn't feel the need to go after those who hadn't actively committed treason. Plus, in September that year, Edward had more important things to take care of. Yes, in September of 1464, the kingdom received what would normally be joyous news. The king had gotten married! The problem was, he had married a commoner, who was English, a widow, and a Lancastrian. Oh, and she had children from that earlier marriage. While I think Edward IV's marriage to Elizabeth Woodville was a rather brilliant move in some ways, he'd married someone who had proven she could have children, and therefore his line wouldn't be at risk. Don't worry, Edward knew he could have children. He hadn't done it for this reason. He had married her because she was beautiful, and he wanted her. It's really that basic. While a totally normal reason for most people to get married, this was not how a king acted, at least not for his first marriage. Royal marriages were for prestige and statecraft. As many of you may know, Edward's closest advisor, military leader, his cousin Warwick, was enraged. He had been working for months to secure a French marriage, and Edward had basically just messed up the bed. Thankfully for Edward, he and Warwick made up, at least temporarily, but the Lancastrian cause was about to be dealt its greatest blow. In July of 1465, Henry VI, fugitive king, was apprehended by Warwick. Unlike King Henry's grandfather, Henry IV, Edward was not ready to kill the previous king to secure his throne, at least not at first. But he managed to further alienate Warwick, and this will set up the Lancastrian cause for one last attempt to regain control. Throughout this period, Margaret and her husband were doing what they could to show themselves to be loyal to Edward and the Yorkist cause, and to live normal lives. Nicola Tallis shares reports of Margaret and Stafford's mutual love of hunting and hawking, and that their property at walking was well-appointed and sumptuous. Now, I've mentioned a few times that Margaret was a lover of luxury. And this is so important to discuss. Nicola Tallis has documented her extensive jewelry collection and likes to contrast that with Margaret's image in most people's mind as this conservatively dressed matronly woman. All evidence is to the contrary. She dressed well, had an extensive wine selection, and throughout her life wore expensive jewels. In the most scandalous bit of history, Margaret was even known to gamble and play cards. Yes, she was as religiously devout as normally presented, but there were many facets to her character. While her husband wasn't a great man in the kingdom, possibly by his own choice, he was still a member in good standing and the couple would travel to London regularly. The couple spent time with both of their extended families and were close to Stafford's younger brother and his nephew, as well as Margaret's mother and her vast number of siblings. <laughs> Margaret's mother would actually live to be approximately 72, an impressive age for the day. Stafford, unlike his wife, didn't seem to have any political ambition. Margaret's religious devotion was both outwardly visible and privately sincere. She was generous with her donations to religious houses and was admitted to the co-fraternity of the Order of the Holy Trinity of Narrowsboro, along with her husband and son. This was a way to bind the three of them through a religious cause. Co-fraternities like this were a way for lay people to publicly express their devotion to the church and religious causes. Charity was a foundational aspect of this. With the change in government, there would be long gaps between the moments Margaret got to see her son. One of those recorded was in September of 1467. This meeting would be their last for a long time due mainly to the machinations of her Lancastrian family and their allies. 
In July of 1468, Jasper Tudor began raiding the coastline of Wales, near his dispossessed holding of Pembroke. He captured Denby Castle and held court in his brother's name. King Edward had to respond and sent Henry's guardian, Herbert, to capture a second Lancastrian castle in Wales, Harlech. The castle surrendered on the 14th of August, and Jasper decided it was time to get out of Wales. Henry Tudor accompanied his guardian on this mission. Herbert was created Earl of Pembroke, Jasper's forfeit title. With her former brother-in-law's incursion, the king wanted to make sure Margaret and her husband were as loyal as they claimed to be. He made a royal visit to their home at Walking in December of 1468. The couple welcomed him with all the pomp that would be expected for a royal visit, and the king was momentarily assured of their loyalty. Margaret, though, had only one concern in her life, her son, and his needs would soon make Edward again question the couple. The reason for this questioning wasn't completely Margaret's fault. In July 1469, Warwick and George of Clarence rebelled against Edward. They returned to England and on the 26th of July defeated a small force led by Henry Tudor's guardian at the Battle of Edgecote. Henry was present for this battle. His guardian was executed after being taken prisoner. Henry, though, escaped. Margaret received news that her son's guardian was dead, but no news about her son for days. I can only imagine her distress. Warwick and Clarence were able to capture the king and keep him at Warwick's stronghold, while Warwick attempted to rule on his behalf, and they both attempted to have Clarence declared king in his brother's stead. While Warwick and Clarence were nominally in control, Margaret attempted to entreat Clarence to return her son's title, Richmond, to him. This attempt would give Edward pause when he was released and returned to rule in early September. While Edward's actions didn't hurt Margaret or Stafford, they didn't help. Edward actually elevated Stafford's younger brother, John, to the Earl of Wiltshire in January of 1470. Margaret's older stepbrother also made things difficult for her. Despite Edward removing the attainder that had been passed on his father, Richard Wells had allied himself with Warwick and Clarence. In March 1470, he rose up against Edward and was defeated at the Battle of Loosecote Field. It becomes pretty clear why this is called the Wars of the Roses. He was executed along with his son Robert. They were, of course, attained. Stafford had actually ridden out with Edward and was one of those who broke the news to Margaret's mother that her stepson and stepgrandson were dead. There were rumors that she was involved, but Edward chose to ignore those and pardon her. There were no suggestions that Margaret had anything to do with her stepbrother's rebellion. While the king, Warwick, and Clarence had been making nice publicly, it appears that all wasn't well between the three. The Battle of Loosecote Field brought this out into the open. Documents were found that proved that Warwick and Clarence were involved, and this would lead to them fleeing the country. Landing in Normandy, Warwick eventually formed an alliance with Margaret of Anjou. I cover this in more detail in Edward of Westminster's episode, so make sure to listen to that. When Warwick returned and Edward fled for the continent, Margaret's world was transformed. Warwick placed Henry VI on the throne as his puppet king. Jasper Tudor returned, and Margaret was able to see her son again. She was no longer a suspected Lancastrian sympathizer. She was the sister-in-law of the king, the mother of his only nephew. Henry Tudor was ordered to the king's presence. On the 27th of October, 1470, Henry Tudor met the man he was named for. The story that Henry VI prophesied that his nephew would one day rule England is probably a bit made up. If true, it points to the state of Henry VI's mind more than divine prophecy. Remember, Henry VI had his own son to rule after him, at least until April the following year. Henry Tudor's wardship was returned to Jasper Tudor, and he would remain in his mother's company for a time. He returned to walking with his mother and stepfather at the end of October. His mother was seemingly excited and proud to show him around her vast estates and the surrounding towns. Henry was 13, and Margaret would have been only 26. When Henry left on the 11th of November, this would be the last time Margaret saw him for more than 14 years. 
Jasper Tudor's attainder had been reversed. Can't have the king's brother being treated so poorly. Margaret was again hopeful her son's title and lands would be returned, but Clarence was not willing to hand this over. While Warwick was in control with Henry as his puppet, plans were being made overseas for two parties to return to England. One from France, led by Margaret of Anjou, Henry VI's wife, and their son, Edward of Westminster. The second from Flanders, led by Edward IV and his loyal brother, Richard Duke of Gloucester. The Yorkist party would win the race to England by a month, and Clarence defected to his brother's side. Warwick was defeated and killed on the 14th of April, 1471, at the Battle of Barnet. Margaret of Anjou and her forces landed on the 14th of April, 1471. Margaret's husband had joined Edward for the battle, despite an attempt by Margaret's cousin, Edmund Beaufort, to convince him to join the Lancastrian cause weeks before the battle. Stafford had stayed loyal to Edward and would join him for Barnet. While Stafford didn't die in the battle, he was injured, and much like her son, just a few years earlier, it would be a long time before she received word of her husband's condition. She actually had to travel to London, which wasn't exactly a safe journey at the moment, to get word to him before she found out he was injured. Her headstrong nature is impressive even to this day. She had him brought home to walking to be cared for. His wounds would eventually kill him on the 4th of October, 1471. Once again, at 28, Margaret was a widow. Stafford was generous to Margaret and his stepson in his will, leaving Henry Tudor horse-related items. He addressed Margaret in this final document as his best beloved wife. Interestingly, Stafford's crest does not feature on Margaret's tomb, which he had a great deal of say over. It does, though, include a Stafford knot. It's best described as a pretzel-shaped knot with the large arc at the top. Other than bequeaths to his loyal servants, he left the remainder of his worldly goods to his wife. She was also the executor of his will. One of the more important, at least for our story, mentions in his will was that of his servant, Reginald Bray. Just remember his name. The couple had been married for approximately 13 years. With the defeat of Henry VI's wife and son, and the death of the latter at the Battle of Tewkesbury on the 4th of May, along with the death of her cousin Edmund and his brother John at the same battle, Margaret may have realized something that was unthinkable just days earlier. She was the heir to the Lancastrian royal cause. Furthermore, when Henry VI was killed on the 21st of May, 1471, Margaret became the senior Lancastrian claimant to the throne of England, and her son was her heir. Jasper had originally fled to Wales with her son, and then was unable to join forces with Queen Margaret. He had then fled to the continent with Henry after her defeat, apparently urged on by Margaret in fear of her son's life. The pair originally sailed for France, but due to weather landed in Brittany. The Duke of Brittany, Francis, offered them protection. This meant that he and Henry were safe, but Margaret may be in danger herself. Her first steps were to return to her mother. She needed time to plan her next moves wisely, and her next move was marriage. Margaret appears to have been a woman deeply aware of the benefits that a well-planned marriage could bring. Think about her experience. Her first marriage had been made in an attempt to protect her first husband. Her second as almost a reward to him from his brother, and her third instigated of her own choosing to protect herself. She was a shrewd and aware woman. While her third marriage had been someone who could have picked either side in the ongoing civil struggle, her fourth needed to be a loyal Yorkist, or at least appear to be so. It's very clear at this point that Edward IV was a stable and powerful king, and the throne would not be taken again while he ruled. Her research led her to Thomas Stanley. Stanley was the oldest son of the same named Baron Stanley, King of Man. I'm not joking about that second title. The Isle of Man is an island between England and Ireland. Today, it's a crown dependency, which makes it a bit of a tax haven. The Stanley family had been titular Kings of Man since 1406. I'd like to emphasize here that while called kings, they were really lords with a fancy title. You'll notice that King of Man follows the lower ranking title, Baron Stanley, when normally a royal is referred to by their superior title first. 
Obviously, the Stanley family wasn't going to claim they were actual kings, hence it being stated after their baronial title. The family would actually change their King of Man title to Lord of Man at the very end of Henry VII's reign, which was probably a good call when thinking about Henry VII's successor. Now that we're done with the fun little title aside, back to Margaret, or at least her fourth husband. The younger Thomas Stanley was only about eight years older than Margaret. He had been married previously to Eleanor Neville, one of Warwick's six sisters. His father Salisbury had 12 children. Stanley and Eleanor had between them 11 children, though three survived to adulthood. Stanley had been a member of Henry VI court, but had seen which side would win and defected to Edward IV. He had avoided fighting for anyone in 1471, and Edward IV had been unimpressed. But Stanley had been forgiven and was a member of the king's household. Stanley could best be described as a pragmatic man who would change allegiances but could still keep both sides happy. He probably would have made a great lawyer. No insult to lawyers, it's actually a compliment. Marrying Margaret could have hurt Stanley, but her wealth would make his life much easier. For Margaret, it would bring her closer to the throne and help show that she wasn't a threat to Edward's reign. The king would have been aware of these plans early on and may have encouraged or helped arrange them. Like her earlier marriage to Stafford, it appeared that Margaret was set on not having any children with Stanley. While like her previous marriages, this wasn't a love match, Margaret and Stanley were generally content in their marriage. The couple were married in July 1472, prior to the customary mourning period for Stafford. This points to how precarious Margaret's situation was. Due to Stanley's position at court, he and Margaret spent a great deal of time there. It appears that the king was comfortable with her being present. Stanley was sent to France in 1474 as part of a delegation to negotiate peace between England and France. Edward IV had taken his only chance at invading France in July that year, but was persuaded to look to peace. The French king, Louis XI, basically bribed Edward for peace, and part of their seven-year truce included a betrothal of Edward's oldest daughter, Elizabeth, to Louis' son Charles, the Dauphin. I'll be covering this more in Elizabeth's episodes. Edward sent agents to Brittany to attempt to convince the Duke to turn over Henry Tudor and his uncle Jasper. Edward promised Henry a safe return and possibly marriage to one of his daughters. Margaret warned her son and former brother-in-law not to listen, and for the time being, the pair stayed in Brittany. Margaret was active in the parts of court that a woman should be involved in. She was assigned to wait upon the queen and her daughters during their procession to rebury Richard III, Duke of York, Edward's beloved father, and Edmund of Rutland, his younger brother, at Fotheringay, at the end of July 1476. This same year, Duke Francis agreed to hand over Henry Tudor to Edward, after the English king promised he'd be well treated. Henry, realizing he might not be safe, possibly warned by his mother, fled the English envoys sent to bring him home. After seeking protection in a church in St. Malo, he was protected by the local populace, and Francis ended up changing his mind. 1476 wasn't done being a busy year. In December, George of Clarence's wife died, likely due to complications in childbirth. While this was common for the time, Clarence's grief overtook him and he began to appear unstable. He was constantly at odds with his brother and was eventually found guilty of treason. He was executed in 1478. For King Edward, this was devastating. For Margaret, though, it was pretty good news. Her son's title was now something she might be able to get back. She did decide to wait a little longer before asking the king. Margaret likely would have celebrated with her husband in 1482 when her stepson, George Stanley, married Joan Lestrange, ninth Baroness Strange. Joan was the daughter of the eighth Baron Strange, John, and his wife, Jaquetta Woodville, one of Elizabeth Woodville's sisters, obviously named after their mother. This gives the Stanley family a personal link to the Woodville family that will become important in just a few years. In 1482, Margaret was finally ready to approach the king regarding her son's title. 
Her mother had died at some point that year. She was buried next to Margaret's father. Her mother's death may have spurned her on. She would have missed her son deeply, and having him returned must have been her greatest wish. Edward agreed that Henry could receive his share of his grandmother's estate in June of 1482, if he returned to England. This was a huge sum of money, approximately £276,000 in 2019. Edward even drafted a royal pardon for Henry, but it was not to be. At the start of the following year, Louis XI renounced his truce with Edward by signing a treaty with the Holy Roman Emperor, and Edward declared war. Part of this treaty did include betrothing the Dauphin, Edward's daughter's fiance, to the emperor's daughter. In the end, none of this would matter, because on the 9th of April, 1483, Edward IV died of an illness, and with the king's death, I'll be stopping for this week. I hope you'll join me next week, and thank you again for putting up with my scratchy voice and my daughter coloring in the background. She did go take a nap eventually. Hopefully, I'll be well next week. See you then. Thank you for listening to Past. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at PastPod. That's P-A-S-S-E-D-P-O-D. Please feel free to email me at pastpod at gmail.com. I have a Patreon that can be found at patreon.com backslash pastpod.